please rise for the procession and remain standing until they seated. Please uh, be seated. Sani wonan. Huyenand. Dumelan. Good uh, evening. Professor Sarah Gravett, uh, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education. Professor Nadine Peterson, uh, the person we are here for tonight, I am personally looking forward to hearing your inauguration. Professor Doria Daniels, a respondent, she is at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, she used to be a professor here at the University of Johannesburg. A senior lecturer. Senior lecturer. <laughs> so I am uh, uh, promoting you. <laughs> it's called time travel, going to the past and promoting someone. Senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is indeed a great honor and a special privilege for me to welcome you to this professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Nadine Peterson at the University of Johannesburg, which happens to be the largest university in Johannesburg. <laughs> As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to her loved ones, special guests, and her colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Peterson, and for, of, of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public event. It is a public event because this is uh, the time in which the appointed professors are supposed to profess to the community and all <coughs> our stakeholders. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. In fact, this came from the Catholic Church. Firstly, it is an expression of a welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise. And Professor Peterson has a great deal of expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Of course, in colonial traditions subscribed to by universities, this simply means a gown and a cap is adorned to a person who is going to deliver the inaugural um, address. Uh, traditionally, especially in our African community, one would accept a blanket when one has reached a stage where people would view such a person as a prophet. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown today I'm going to, uh, to put it on her so that she can be seen to be a professor to those who might doubt, they, and, but those with ears, you are going to hear her address, and for those with eyes, you are going to witness this occasion when I am the dean, um, adorn her the gown and the cap. Today, it is really a great 
honor for me. This is my fifth inaugural lecture as a vice chancellor. And five is a very special number. <laughs> uh, five is special because it is odd. Uh, for those of you who are mathematicians, you will know what I'm talking about, isn't it? Uh, it is odd. It is odd because what you have done is not something that everybody can be able to do. Only few people can be able to achieve what you have achieved. So it is odd. If it was not odd, we would be having many inaugural lectures even at the University of Johannesburg. We just have a handful of them uh, per year. So I am looking forward to listening to your inaugural lecture, to engage you, not just here. Uh, in the next Senate, Professor Peterson is going to be delivering not this inaugural lecture, <laughs> but she is going to be educating senators about the fantastic work that she is doing. The work that she is doing is not just for, 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 for intellectual sake, but it contributes very, very importantly to an area that uh, we have been battling as a country. The area of education is an area where we can basically say as a society, we have failed. We drop a great deal of students along the way and they never recover. And education is such an important, it's not a commodity, it's wealth. It's such an important wealth that whoever is educated, it can never be taken away from them. Material positions can be taken away from us, but education and knowledge cannot be taken away from us. So as we battle as a society to try to modernize our society, we acknowledge that if there is only one thing that if we don't get right, we shall never modernize this society, is actually education. I was doing the statistics about the countries with the most PhDs per capita. Uh, South Korea came in the top five. You will agree with me that uh, that education is reflected in its economy. So everybody is, is almost confused as to how do we modernize this uh, society. I hear some politicians talking about radical economic transformation. There can never be radical economic transformation if you have huge amounts of people who cannot read or write. There can never be radical economic transformation until we have many, many more people who are going to emulate what Professor Peterson has done and come and deliver their own inaugural lectures. There can never be any form of economic revolution until, as a society, we move away from making decisions based on superstition to making decisions based on hard evidence. So, Professor Peterson, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> it is indeed my pleasure to, to basically uh, oversee this inaugural lecture. I thank you very much, Nia Wonga. Why thank you. Now I am going to invite our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education, Professor Sarah Gravett. Her nickname is Salki. 
Uh, for those uh, of you who do not understand Afrikaans, when you put key, you know, it means this person is intense. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, to welcome Professor Graber to come and introduce uh, So good evening, honoured guests. It is indeed my privilege to introduce Professor Nadine Peterson. You have her full CV, so I am only going to present some excerpts from her curriculum vitae. And I will start focusing on her postgraduate studies. She obtained a B at honours degree cum laude at the Rand Afrikaans University and was awarded for her B at honours, the award for the best B at honours student. This was followed then by her MA degree. The first degree was of course cum, cum laude and also the MA degree, again from the Rand Afrikaans University. And for that she was awarded the Chancellor's Medal. Once again, the best student in the, in, at master's level in the Faculty of Education. Propitherson has more than 12 years of experience at management level in the Faculty of Education. She has served as Head of Department for Childhood Education from 2014 to 2018. In this capacity, she was responsible for the implementation of the two primary school teacher education programs and their integration with the teaching school, the Funda Ujabuli School at the Soweto campus. She was also responsible for the inception of a new Be It Honours program. She supervised staff coordination to du duplicate the foundation phase program on the Siabuswa campus of the University of Mpumalanga during this time. So she's not also only a manager, she also is a researcher. She's a C2 NRF rated researcher, and as such, she has a wide ranging experience with research supervision at postgraduate levels, with research funding proposal development, and in administration of research projects. She has twice served as guest editor for the accredited journals Education Has Change, for a special issue on community service learning, and for the South African Journal of Childhood Education for a special issue on strengthening foundation phase teacher education. She has raised considerable research funding in the last eight years and works in developmental research teams with strong international collaboration. Prof. Peterson has more than 20 years of teaching experience in higher education, specifically in the fields of pre-service teacher education and in higher education. From the time of her involvement in the Community Higher Education Service and Partnerships in Initiatives, she has been active in curriculum development, research and advocacy for integrating service learning into higher education. She regularly conducts workshops and seminars for academics on integrating social justice and care into service learning and establishing service learning integration in programs. She's currently working with the UJ Community Engaging, Engagement Division and Advancement on grant funding for volunteering and mentor training for supervisors within the wider UJ environment. Prof. Peterson continues to lead initiatives and frameworks in the faculty to give expression to the university's strategic objectives, promoting decolonization of the curriculum, developing 21st century skills, and teaching with technology, issues she will advance in a new position as Vice Dean Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Education. Since 2010, she also serves her broader education community in her capacity as an external trustee of the Sassel Inzalo Board and as a chair of the Sassel Inzalo Bursary Committee. Professor Peterson, we look forward to your inaugural address. Vice-Chancellor, Executive Dean, Professor Daniels, 
members of the MEC and Senate, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends and family. I'm honored by your presence here tonight for the delivery of my inaugural address entitled A Scholarship of Engagement, Service Learning in Teacher Education. As a higher education teacher and scholar, I'm interested in promoting social justice, equitable educational provision, and with it, care for students. As a teacher educator, I'm concerned about the kind of beginner teachers we are graduating, their attributes, how well they are prepared for practice and for educating young learners in schools, and how they will contribute to the professionalization of teaching as a career. As an academic mentor, I'm concerned about growing the next generation of young black researchers. And of course, as a social scientist, I want to produce not only usable knowledge, but also new knowledge for the context where I work. My research is therefore geared towards educational justice in action and the promotion of knowledge that has utility and is real and practice-based. Of the four kinds of scholarships proposed by Boyer, the scholarship of engagement best describes my work, which is situated at the confluence of the three pillars of the academy, teaching, service, and research. In arguing for the scholarship of engagement, Boyer quotes Oscar Handlin, who says, scholarship has to prove its worth, not on its own terms, but by service to the nation and the world, and argues that the academy must become a more vigorous partner in the search for answers to our most pressing social, civic, economic, and moral problems, and connect with our children, our schools, our teachers, and our cities. Higher education, and for me, specifically teacher education, is arguably the most promising platform for this type of scholarship. In teacher education, it is possible to integrate not only the epistemologies of the three pillars, but also the empirical inquiries. Here, I have theorized service learning in teacher education, and I have argued for the theoretical frames of social justice and of care. My investment has been in student teachers learning through service, their subjectivity and their agency, with a view of finding out how we can best prepare them for practice. I have also investigated models of curriculum design. For the most part tonight, I will focus on how service learning in teacher education contributes to the issue that occupies me most. Who is the teacher of the future and how best do we prepare her for the profession? I've often thought about the origins of my orientation for advocacy, social justice and care. I suppose I can first trace these to my family and educational background. My earliest memories are of hushed stories about my father's elder sister, Jeanette Salby, who with her husband Arnold were persecuted by the apartheid government and lived in exile for more than 30 years. I also have other vivid memories. As a 13-year-old marching and fleeing from police with guns and dogs during the state of emergency in the 1980s, my grandmother's anguish at a 16-year-old cousin having to take shelter with others for months to evade the secret police, and the difficulties faced by family and friends, Noor, Michael, Vanessa, Andre, Ali, Jesse and Cyril, who worked tirelessly in community structures against the regime during those years. During my post-school years, I joined other student teachers in protest against second class teacher education, and we spent a week in Sun City as a result. And no, I don't mean Sun City that belonged to Saul Kersner. <laughs> And as a new teacher, I spoke out against receiving unequal benefits in comparison with men. I had a personal understanding of being the other, subject to unjust policies and unequal education. 
my academic understanding of the struggle against the unfair and the unjust was cemented in my postgraduate studies. Here, I began to connect the practice of struggle with the theory of struggle. First in an honors degree in adult and community education, working with the writing of theorists such as Paulo Freire, where this evening's respondent, Professor Doria Daniels, served as my, one of my first mentors into this world. I also read the work of critical scholars such as Bell Hooks and Ira Shaw. In my master's studies, I encountered the theories of transformational learning and those of community and adult education. It was under Sarah Gravett's supervision in my master's research that I first investigated the experiences of women academics as the other in the academy. Participants shared with me their stories of being, becoming, and surviving in a male-dominated and often hostile world. One participant's quote stayed with me. She told me that in order to survive and fit in, she shut her mouth and wore beige. <laughs> when I joined the RAU as a staff member in 1997, I quickly realized I was still the other. I was black, a woman, without a master's or a PhD, and consequently still subject to inequality and injustice, from the conditions of my employment contract to how my ideas were received. For instance, as an inexperienced higher education teacher, when I introduced the concepts of justice and care into teacher education, I was chastised by a senior white professor for making teacher education political. He claimed education should be an act of neutrality. Needless to say, we argued vehemently. But this marked a turning point for me. As an emerging scholar, I had begun reconciling my personal experiences with my epistemological positioning as a new higher education teacher. In this journey, I had the support of mentors such as Rukshana Osman, Marupen Mudiba, and Connie Malloy. I made my decision. I would not be controlled in this environment. I would also not allow my thinking or my academic work towards care and justice to be constrained. In short, I would not shut up and I would not wear beige. <laughs> this naturally impacted my role in teacher education and in consideration of the, who the teacher of the future is, and how I could contribute to her preparation, one of the first issues I honed in on is the role of teachers within a democratic society. I questioned how we could educate teachers who would be responsible for teaching and for shaping a new democracy if we did not teach about the other, about addressing inequality and injustice, and if we did not teach for and to care. I argued for education as a political act. As a doctoral student in a Joint Education Trust funded project, I was inspired by Henning's work with lay teachers towards formal professionalization. In a groundbreaking community service project in Wheeler's Farm, Fine Town and Orange Farm, more than 400 unqualified teachers were served and 287 were eventually awarded an initial teacher education diploma. I built on this foundation as I theorized the movement of academic community service from Ivory Park in reference to informal settlements to the Ivory Tower. Under Henning's supervision, I conceptualized arguments about the space, place, and shape of community service learning in teacher education. Supported by UJ and Chess, I was trained by pioneers in the field like Tim Stanton, Bob Ringel, and Andy Furco. Service learning as a form of experiential learning is best described by Bringle and Hatcher as a course-based credit-bearing educational experience in which students A, participate in organized service activity that meets identified community needs, and B, 
reflect on the service activity in such a way as to gain further understanding of the course content, a broader appreciation of the discipline, and an enhanced sense of personal values and civic responsibility. This form of learning thus aims for an integration of academic content and on-the-ground service. Reciprocity of knowledge and reflection about the exchange of learning and service are at the core of student learning. In the teacher education literature, service learning is credited as a means of cultivating the moral and civic mindset for teaching, as a way of engaging with schools and communities in reciprocally beneficial manner, and as a method of developing integrated pedagogical content knowledge. It is also advocated for the promotion of social justice and as a pedagogy to prompt students to examine their political, ethical, and socio-historically situated construction of practice. These arguments shaped my doctoral research with a thesis entitled Service Learning and in Teacher Education about otherness and locating the self. Theorizing service learning in my PhD strengthened my epistemological and ontological positioning as a teacher education researcher. It also enabled me to contribute to an understanding of care and social justice as theoretical frames for service learning, particularly in South African teacher education. In fact, I believed I could even shape the new UJ's policy on service. <laughs> I concluded my thesis with a manifesto outlining the limitations of academic community service as social responsibility as it's viewed in the corporate sector. In it, I challenged the newly established UJ, I don't think anybody read it, to guard against the commercialization of service to promote a particular image of the institution in the public arena. I instead argued for an integration of service with the academic curriculum of higher education in order to nurture a sense of social justice and care in students in a way that influences their lives as future professionals. Service learning in teacher education, however, has its detractors. Many question the value of an additional experiential learning opportunity in an already full curriculum, especially when students learn during teaching practice in schools. I, in turn, like my colleagues at the UJ, question whether teaching practice as experiential and practice-based learning opportunity contributes optimally to the education of the teacher of the future. In a particularly powerful critique of teaching practice in pre-service teacher education, Gallego has come to describe its processes of socializing student teachers into the profession as a scholarship of oppression. The criticisms of teaching practice are numerous. It is criticized for being too far removed from coursework to enable students to make the connection with their practical experiences. Field experiences are also said to be too limited to really give students an idea of the complexities of the task of teaching. The most damning criticisms, however, are that teaching practice is restrictive in nature and scope and that it tends to emphasize practice issues, leading students unquestioningly into routinized views of teaching or in the execution of habitual practices. Innovation in teaching practice is, also easily, is not also easily encouraged and so many students revert to the default of their own school years. And this phenomenon is known in the literature as the apprenticeship of observation. South African research reflects a growing recognition of the challenges of teaching practice. The Department of Higher Education and Training has attempted to provide direction nationally. For instance, they commissioned research into the establishment of teaching schools and professional practice schools as ways to strengthen teaching practice. And in the current DHET primary school teacher education project, a dedicated work stream has been created to investigate the challenges of work integrated learning. 
and design a model as the basis of a social compact between key stakeholders to improve teaching practice. The findings of these projects show that there is still a long way to go. I believe that part of the answer lies, lies in another experiential pedagogy in teacher education, service learning. And for the past 15 years, I've argued for a stronger role for service learning in teacher education and focused <coughs> my research on student learning through the lenses of social justice and care. I am of the view that service learning develops specific kinds of teacher knowledge essential for the teacher of the future. The first such a knowledge is the very practice knowledge of teaching, of children, of teachers, of community and society, and the role of education. Service learning as experiential pedagogy contests the idea that university academics are the sole producers of knowledge. In this respect, service learning serves as an inductive, process-based pedagogy in which students become active contributors to their own learning and take account of the knowledge in communities beyond the university classroom. In essence, it moves students closer to what Guterres describes as a production of knowledge with others, in which they begin to establish themselves as creators and co-creators of knowledge instead of operating solely as consumers of knowledge produced by and for others. What is more, they produce such knowledge in a very specific alliance with the very people whom they are serving, such as school learners and parents, according to the social, historical, and cultural contexts in which they find themselves, creating a basis for the production of knowledge for action. Service learning also provides for the development of connected teacher knowledge. Through service, students can connect their academic themes with what they and others are experiencing in their everyday lives and in service sites. They also learn to describe their learning in their own language. Such a model of educational dialogue grounded in student and community concerns and requiring a considered response means that students learn how to talk with their peers and community in service of their academic learning. This is decolonized knowledge in its most basic form. When students in higher education are invited to participate in their learning with others, they are sent a hopeful message about their worth and their ability to contribute to their own lives and society. They can then too begin to take an active role in their own learning and in the educational process and in transforming society. This approach resonates with Dewey's argument that the only learning which is really educative is the learning which emerges in and through the process of learning itself, requiring both an individual and a social component. Service learning thus leads to the development also of socially connected knowledge. Through the establishment of small communities of practice, where students work with peers in service of young children and communities, they learn to operationalize aspects of teacher academic and professional learning. In communities of practice, people learn optimally under very specific conditions. One, members need to value their collective competence. Two, they need to build trusting relationships so that they are able to engage in joint activities and discussions. And three, they need to develop a shared repertoire of resources and tools to address recurring problems. Drawing on the work of Brown, Collins, and Duguid, I am of the view that it is in the authenticity of the social context of service learning that the culture and nature of student learning <coughs> is influenced most. Students move into and engage with all the elements of the situation in which they serve 
and learn. They learn about the world by being and acting in the world and reflecting on the experiences with a very specific epistemological slant, making knowledge for the academy and also for the teaching profession. Students do not only learn about justice and care as concepts, but they learn to develop a justice care disposition on the ground. They think about justice and care on the ground. They question academic knowledge of justice and care on the ground. Thus, students have the opportunity to integrate reflective forms of personal and professional knowledge with academic knowledge and to critique it in terms of its standards of service. For student teachers, it can shift the restrictive nature and scope of typical practice experiences and move them away from adopting a one-size-fits-all approach to situations. So, if students learn how to organize a story festival in Soweto, or they design gallery walks for the social sciences, they learn to work collaboratively on a joint mission in service of young children's learning. It is arguments such as these that have led a recent doctoral student to advocate service learning as a cohesive device in teacher education. Petka argues that student teachers learn, often in an ad hoc, ad hoc manner, the techniques, the tools, and the content of pedagogy and classroom management, and then do not develop a sense of being directly responsible for learners' progress and of caring for them. She refers to this as the Achilles heel of teacher education. I'm tripping over my words because I'm smiling at Khadija. <laughs> <laughs> I share this view. It is in the development of care and accountability for learners where service learning is able to make the greatest contribution to teacher education in authentic situations where they can, for a while, take full responsibility for a learning event on some scale and to be accountable for it, unlike teaching once-off lessons. One way for students to get to learn to know learners and learn to care and be accountable for them is to develop knowledge of care. As much as they learn the general declarative subject content knowledge, or the what, and the pedagogical or procedural knowledge, or the how of the curriculum. Knowledge of care for me is about the why of teaching, or what Dewey refers to as the formation of a social disposition. In support of this stance, I draw on Schulman who argues that professionals not only have to understand and perform, they have to be certain kinds of human beings. To use the language of the education of clergy, they have to undergo a certain kind of formation of character and values so that they become a kind of person to whom we are prepared to entrust the responsibilities of our health system, of our education system, of our souls and of the kind of justice we expect to see pursued in the society. For the most part, teacher education programs have traditionally considered the moral foundations of education and their practice within it. A teacher is, after all, the person who has the task of caring for the pupils in schools and of making decisions that affect their lives in the educational setting. In South Africa, care as a graduate attribute has also long been recognized in the legislative framework for teacher education through the inclusion of a community and pastoral role. However, the success of its implementation is mixed. I believe the challenge is in how care is conceptualized and enacted in teacher education. To me, care should not be a topic of study as much as it should be a way of being and doing. In the words of Dewey, there's an epistemic warrant for care, which encompasses more than an attitude or a disposition in the caregiver. It includes an epistemic position of what counts as caring knowledge, 
warranted by the assertion that accountability comes with caring and for that matter with being cared for. To be accountable to this warrant, teacher educators have to move away from approaches which, in which concepts such as care are studied and objectified. <coughs> Beyond objectification, teacher education programs need learning environments in which care can be encountered in a responsible and in a moral way. To that I would add, in a loved way. The prominent the care theorist Nodding asserts that the primary aim of every educational institution and of every educational effort must be the maintenance and enhancement of caring. It functions as an end means and criterion for judging suggested means. We cannot separate means and ends in education because the desired result is part of the process and the process carries with it the notion of persons undergoing it becoming somehow better. My contention is that service learning is the ideal pedagogy for bringing the means and the ends together in the development of a disposition of care. Through acts of care and service, students can learn to establish relationships, put themselves in the shoes of the other and respond with care in their actions within the curriculum and beyond the school as institution. I use the following definition of care. When we see the other's reality as a possibility for us, we must act to eliminate the intolerable, to reduce the pain, to fill the need to actualize the dream. When I am in this sort of relationship with another, when the other's reality becomes a real possibility for me, I care. This definition proposes approaching care as a relational ethic, which occurs in a dyad, consisting of the carer, or the one caring, and the one who receives care, which we also refer to as the cared for. The idea of care as a relational ethic is similar to Gilligan's arguments for ethical moral development, which involves human beings in relationships with each other in real situations. I argue that students in their pre-service years need opportunities to establish such relationships and to practice caring inside and outside of the classroom. In this respect, notions of care and of social justice operate in tandem. An orientation of justice prevents care from becoming a type of educational philanthropy and in turn enables issues of justice to take on the values of trust, of emotional empathy and attachment. Without an operationalized sense of care, students will not be likely to <coughs> enter a relationship with the other, nor are they likely to work towards justice in education. A second important consideration implied in Nodding's definition of care is that it guides teacher educators towards a broadened understanding of their responsibilities. I believe that students can only learn to care and enact genuine caring in their service learning activities if they have first learned it by being part of caring relationships with their teachers and fellow students. The teacher educator is where this starts. She, with her colleagues, needs to structure teacher education programs to invite students to enter caring apprenticeships in a way that resonates with the notion of cognitive apprenticeships as theorized by Brown, Collins and Duguid. She also needs to develop the interpersonal relationships embedded in teaching as a part of the pedagogy of teacher education. She has to exemplify in her own practice what she professes to count as caring. As the one caring a higher education teacher sets the tone for an educational dialogue with her students, the cared for, in the educational relationship, in which students are given the opportunity to first experience 
and then practice care as both acting subject and gegenstand. Under these circumstances, it is possible for students and their teacher educators to become collaborative and active agents in constructing new kinds of knowledge and relationships. I turn next to an exploration of the findings of my research in this area. My early research was of high school student teacher learning in service sites that included schools, NGOs with an environmental education or entrepreneurship focus, and educational facilities at the Johannesburg Hospital and the Siswe Tropical Diseases Hospital. While I had aimed for the service learning curriculum to operate as an interface between theory and practice, findings in this eight-year project reveal mixed results. A proportion of the group developed as responsible citizens, providing service as civic altruism. A second group I characterized as participatory citizens, students showing care, but with little awareness of underlying social issues in their service sites. The third group I described as social reformers. Their service and resulting actions were oriented towards social change with evidence of a critical interrogation of existing social issues. Using design-based research, I distilled principles to inform future service learning curriculum design. These principles were then migrated into two primary school teacher education programs. With my colleagues over the last seven years, I implemented the following. Incrementally integrating service learning into a number of courses over the duration of the qualification. Granting student teachers opportunities to start small but jump in with service learning projects from their first year. Creating service placements that extend over a substantial period of time with the same service recipients. And moving with a developmental focus towards increasingly mature and well-developed service learning projects. These projects include sport and development, storytelling in English language learning, art and music, gardening and science education, and the design of a gallery walk for the social sciences. What I have learned from primary school student teachers who engage in this type of service is that their proximity to the service participants in a community-oriented space optimizes the influence of the pedagogy. Implementing service in a university-affiliated school on the campus has specific advantages. It localizes the scale and the scope of the projects and student response to specific community needs. For instance, in a food gardening project, students teach young children about seed germination and healthy eating as well as food security. What is more, they link their work to the school curriculum. This is the type of work that establishes the value of self-sufficiently, as proposed by Julius Nyerere. At the same time, they get to understand the daily struggles of food security in children's lives and plan a tangible response by building mini greenhouses from recyclable materials at the school. The project creates awareness of how collaborative efforts from stakeholders can address food scarcity and provide a model for replication in learners' home lives. There are many more such examples in the projects of childhood teacher education. We have also learned that the shared contributions of multiple researchers in an integrated teacher education program yields results. Service learning and other practice learning coalesce around a central organizing framework. Such an integrated approach enables teacher educators to use the pedagogy of service learning as one of many to teach future teachers to study communities children and schooling, aiming for educational justice. Social justice in education is then not only a topic of study in university coursework, it is also about teaching food gardening at schools and in the backyards. 
Most importantly, such an approach is likely to contribute to the development of what Schulman refers to as a signature pedagogy for teacher education. Signature pedagogies are described as modes of teaching that have been inextricably identified with preparing people for a particular profession. Schulman has argued ironically that teacher education has no signature pedagogy as do professional training of health practitioners, lawyers and clergy. Petker contends that Schulman has gone as far as saying that there is no teacher education. Hypothesizing about this disturbing comment from a leading teacher education specialist, she concludes that service learning is a possible gateway to the forming of a signature pedagogy for training teachers. In tonight's address, I have argued for the contribution of service learning to the development of knowledge for teaching. I see this as the basis for building my further career as a professor of teacher education. I would like, however, to come back to the question I posed at the beginning. Who is the teacher of the future and how best do we prepare her for the profession? Schulman warns, professionals really can employ simple algorithms or protocols of practice in performing their services. How then does a professional adapt to new and uncertain circumstances? She exercises judgment. One might therefore say that professional education is about developing pedagogies to link ideas, practices and values under conditions of inherent uncertainty that necessitate not only judgment in order to act, but also cognizance of the consequences of one's actions. In the presence of uncertainty, one is obligated to learn from experience. I believe that the unknown future that awaits our new teachers and the children that they will serve will need a firm foundation like never before. I believe that the values of care and social justice learned through experience with others in service learning during the pre-service years are the pillars on which ideals such as trust, collaboration, innovation and resilience can be built. Without this, how will we prepare future teachers to address all the gaps that the threat and possibilities of artificial intelligence and automation will create in society. I'm looking at you, Professor Marwala. <laughs> and how else will we prepare future teachers to teach for innovation that is socially and economically embedded? And lastly, how else will we teach our future teachers the bonds of working together and standing together in times of uncertainty to assist those who will inevitably be left by the wayside. I thank you. Good evening academics and honored guests. I feel so honored to be part of this very momentous occasion and to have been invited to be the respondent to Nadine's inaugural lecture. I've known Nadine since 1997 as my student and as a higher education lecturer and as an accomplished scholar and as my friend. The Nadine that I know is passionate feisty, outspoken, committed, driven, but also very generous, caring, and reflective. A scholarly work that tonight's lecture unpacked is built on her life as a black South African woman, mother, sister, community worker, human being, citizen, activist. And this is why the feminist saying the personal is political is such a fitting description of the philosophical underpinnings of Nadine's scholarly work and how she chose to position herself as a teacher educator. 
She wants her students, or any student for that matter, who's uh, studying education, um, she wants that student to graduate from the teacher education programs to have a better understanding of the complexities embedded in racially, socially, and ethnically diverse learner populations, and she chal and challenge student indifference to the alienating experiences that marginalized learner populations have in mainstream schools. So against this back background, she points out how teachers are in the privileged position to become advocates for a just, equitable society. But how do you accomplish this in a student population that is so diverse, so separated, oftentimes come across as so uncaring, and sometimes come across as so ignorant about what happens in communities that they are not part of, but whose children they end up teaching. So this, the issue that this lecture, this lecture explored tonight was, um, or tried to address, is what does the teacher of the future look like and how do we prepare her for it? Now, in my response, I focus on two aspects. The one being the pedagogy that is important to situate such a philosophy in, and the second one being the value system that grounds such a philosophy. Now, I agree with the concerns raised by the scholar about teaching practice objectives and its decentralized positionings within teacher education programs. Teaching practice tends to be restrictive in nature and in scope. So when teaching practice stints are so brief, it limits the opportunities that uh, student teachers have to experience authentic um, educator experiences. Because as outsiders and as visitors to these um, uh, schools that they are being placed in, it's difficult for them to really gain insider perspectives of what it is to be a real teacher. Um, what, what one finds is that um, they, they observe, they end up only observing those routinized administrative tasks that teachers, ex teachers perform. And so when they graduate from our teacher, teacher education programs, that is what they prioritize. They try to master the customary practices associated with teaching. And what, it, what they then do is they positioned in such a way where the learners and the needs of the learners are then sidelined or it becomes secondary to the um, administrative tasks that then um, uh, take priority. So it is against this back backdrop that Nadine tonight argued for um, a service learning approach to teacher practice. Service learning is a ped pedagogy that has the potential to strengthen the student's professional um, stance positioning within um, the uh, environment, as well as advance her civic responsibility. This is because service learning positions the student teacher as an active contributor of her own learning. The knowledge that the student then acquires is facilitated by an educational dialogue about real challenges that are occurring and that are grounded in, as Nadine says, in the social and cultural, cultural context that they find themselves in these particular schools that are, they are being placed in. So Ira Shaw reminds us that when we invite the student teacher to participate in our own learning, you are showing trust in our capabilities to make a contribution, and you're also in her ability to initiate change. And this is what the departure that happens in the programs that Nadine uh, propagate as opposed to the models that we are currently experiencing. Ones that seem to have a one-size-fits-all pra uh, uh, practice teaching model um, to the one that says student teachers should become protagonists in service of the learner populations. The second issue that I pick out um, from this lecture that Nadine gave tonight and that I consider just as important as pedagogy is the issue of mindfulness about the vulnerability of the children that we teach in our schools. 
Nadine has argued for the teach teaching act as ethical um, engagement and that any teacher education program should promote teaching as a caring profession. And service learning again here lends itself per perfectly to this as student teachers are embedded in contexts where they are confronted with realities that challenge their value systems. And it is in such spaces that one finds then that ethical moral development of students then become a possibility or the possibilities come to the fore. So Nadine, what stood out for me in your very carefully crafted lecture tonight is the following. Your research and scholarship is not just practitioner research. It is far more and wider and broader and I don't know what other adjectives I want to use <laughs> than just that. Yours is about community building. I hear community building when you talk about the pedagogy and the knowledges and the positionings and the how you come to an environment. The message that I took from your lecture is that teaching is not a job, it is a profession with heart. Your scholarship is about the search for a signature pedagogy and, edu and the establishment of an educational culture that best prepares students to be accountable, caring professionals. For you, it is about choosing a pedagogy that positions the student teacher as a catalyst for change. And it is one that engages them in critical dialogue about the world in the world. And because of that, they are able to then critique the oppressive structures in society that place barriers in the way of children's successes. I congratulate you for this very personal, very critical, very thought-provoking lecture that you delivered tonight. And I thank you for sharing your scholarship with us tonight. So again, congratulations. Wow. <laughs> I was even more impressed when she mentioned the word artificial intelligence. <laughs> I am going to invite Professor Peterson and the Executive Dean, Professor Salki Gravett, to come forward for the ruby. Thank you very much uh, for coming. You will agree with me that uh, you learned quite a great deal tonight. I'm reminded of uh, an old expression that says, uh, knowledge not used is no knowledge at all. And what uh, Professor Peterson has been doing, she has been working on creating knowledge that is being used. I think let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> now we have come to the end of this ceremony. So you are all invited to come for drinks and refreshments on the other side. All I advise you is that uh, don't drink and drive. <laughs> and when I say don't drink and drive, I'm saying that if you are driving, don't drink. I'm not saying that don't drink when you are driving. So please, uh, I will request that you all stand up 
so that the procession can leave the building.